Hello everyone, it's Mark here from the YouTube Observatory. I've been helping out with some after school clubs uh, and some brand new stargazing badges recently. And one question I've been asked by the organisers is what equipment do the children or the adults who are helping them out need to bring with them for a stargazing night? So I put together this little video and hopefully that just explains what equipment I use and what I take outside when I go out uh, observing or imaging the moon and the planets. The first thing to remember is it's going to be cold. I know in the UK we don't get those cold temperatures you'll get in Central Europe, Scandinavia, North America, but it's still going to be pretty cold. You're going to get down to about minus 5, minus 10 degrees Celsius. You're going to be standing still, um, so you're, all your body heat's radiating away uh, up into the coldness of space. So having lots of layers on to trap that warmth uh, against your skin is really important. I find a down jacket's very good as well. I've got several layers on underneath this as well and that'll help keep you nice and warm. Wear a pair of jeans or ordinary trousers if you want, put some long johns underneath those as well, a pair of tracksuit bottoms over the top of them as well, thick socks, uh, warm boots, trainers, put some insoles in as well, anything that helps insulate you from the coldness of the ground as well. One thing I found very useful is these fingerless mitts. These are really good. You can put your fingers through so you still have fine control, you can still make notes uh, and turn pages in your star charts, then you can fold the flap over and your fingers stay nice and warm inside. I also like to wear a hoodie as well, so I've got a hood on here and I can put this over the top of my head. So if I'm observing the deep sky, uh, I can use the sides of the hood to block off any stray lights. So if there's a moon uh, still up or if there's a street light in the field of view, I can use that to block off and keep my eyes nicely dark adapted. I also make a hot drink as well so in something like this. I used to make a drink in a you know, an ordinary kitchen cup and what I found was that that would um, get cold by the time I was ready to have a drink. So keeping it in this, you can take the lid on and off, have a few sips, put the lid back on and having a nice warm drink as well will help keep you warm as well. Hat obviously keep your head warm, scarf keeps your face and your neck warm as well. And last but not least is a head torch and the advantage of a head torch over a handheld torch obviously keeps your hands free. So I can put that on and then we have a different coloured light, so I have a, a white light for when I'm setting up or when I'm uh, packing away and then a red torch uh, which helps protect your night vision. So if I was going outside I'd unlock the house, I'd use the white torch to um, open, up the ha open up the observatory and then switch over to the red mode and that means I can be setting up my star charts, rolling the roof back, all that sort of thing uh, and my eyes would be starting to adjust to the dark and I'm ready to pack up, ready when I want the bright light and I'm ready to pack up, put the white light back on as well. And again, of course, see your hands free. So lots of layers, keep yourself warm. Put so many layers of clothing on that it starts to look silly. You'll appreciate it now at these times when you're, you're starting to get cold. Gloves, very important. I like these fingerless mitts with the fold over flaps. It means you get the best of both worlds so your hands can still be kept warm as well. Hat and scarf, hoodie if you've got one, and that's very useful for blocking off stray lights if you're deep sky observing. Um, and also nice traps, nice warm pocket of air next to your head. Okay, so we'll go on to the equipment case next. So the next thing I thought I'd show you is my observing case. Now everything I use at the telescope lives in this and it's a Black & Decker toolbox. I've had it for a few years. It comes part of one of those rolling chests so I've got another kit that lives in the rest of that. Um, but this is what always goes out with me whenever I go out observing. So starting at the top is all my sketching equipment. So there's a lot of deep sky uh, observing and then sketching this with the eyepiece. So I've got pencils, variety of pencils, HB propelling pencils, uh, razors, smudging stuff, lint free cloths, templates for using with the eraser, sanding pads. I also have a hard pencil as well, so I use an HB to do the stars, use the propelling pencil. It's always sharp then. And then a hard pencil as well, which I use to draw in the nebulosity. And I use that then with a blending stamp and then can get the fine tenuous detail of the clusters and, and nebulas and galaxies as well. I've also got my laser pointer in here as well. So if I'm outside with somebody else, I can point out the constellations. So all that sort of stuff. Um, with the putty eraser, all lives in here. I don't have to worry about where it is, I can just pick this up and go outside and I've got everything together. So all the observing stuff lives in there. 
I open up this part. I have my notebook. So in here, you can see the kind of stuff I've been doing. Uh, it's a chart of series. Let's see if I can find something interesting. There you are. There's the, that's why we're on holiday in Le Grange. Uh, M33 with a 20 inch with a 30 millimeter ethos. So there's the core of the galaxy. It's got spiral arms coming off and then little H2 region star clouds and what have you, NGC604 for example. So that all lives in here, so I've got my notebook. I've got my pocket sky atlas. I got this in 2006, so it's 10 years old now. And apart from the cover getting tatty, it's still pretty pristine in size. It's been covered in dew, it's had insects squashed in it, and I've used it night after night after night, hours outside getting wet, getting cold, and it's still in perfectly fine form. So it looks really good. It's a nice size. There's enough detail to be useful, but not too big. I've also got Uranometria as well, but obviously that doesn't fit in here as a much larger thing. I've got the BAA handbook. Not that I really use this anymore, the BAA handbook. Um, it's kind of superseded now by my iPad with Sky Sapphire, and I'll come on to that later. But anyway, I tend to chuck it in here and never ever look at it again. So that's the hardware. Right, let's just move the camera closer. Let me see inside the box. So this is what's inside the equipment case. Uh, it's just a simple wooden uh, framework, just made out of thin plywood. And the eyepiece is obviously at this end, and I just put little circular holes with a hole saw, and the eyepiece is then slot in. So um, it's a combination of eyepieces really. I started off upgrading two Hyperion eyepieces. So that's my 13, I think I've got a 13, 31 and a 24. And I've started upgrading to some of the Teleview eyepieces as well, um, second hand. So I've got a 15 millimeter second hand Plossel, which is really good for the moon and the planets. Lovely eyepiece. 19 mil Panoptic, that's become my workhorse. That's the one I use about 80, 90% of the time. And an eight millimeter ethos which doesn't really get that much use unfortunately it kind of just sits in here and I tend to use the 15 mil um, so yes yeah, so the poor thing doesn't get as much use I've also got a Celestron zoom which I quite enjoy as well particularly when you're using going in a complicated area so if you start hopping through the Virgo galaxy cluster it's useful to be able to go to a wide angle low power find where you want to look for and then zoom in for the high magnification so I find that quite useful and also for solar observing as well, being able to see the whole disk of the sun and then zoom in to look at specific features. So that, that gets used, uh, probably not as much as it should do, but still quite well used. Um, I've then got my filters. So I've got two UHC filters. I've got an Astronomic 2 inch and a Barda 1 and a quarter inch. And that's, uh, it's absolutely stunning. It's well worth the money. Uh, looking at things like the Veil Nebula, um, the Orion Nebula, things like that, absolutely blow your socks off when you put the filter on. Uh, I found using an O3 filter, although it brought out more detail and uh, made the nebulosity easy to see, it dimmed out the stars so much you actually lost quite a lot of the aesthetic detail. So I do prefer a UHC filter over an O3. Obviously, O3 has its strengths as well. And one day I'll look at getting one of those as well. But for the moment, the UHC filter is doing the job. I've got my planetary filters as well, so I've got a 685 infrared pass filter as well, it means I can see into the infrared, get fine details as well, and it stops all the atmospheric distortion, the chromatic aberrations, and then a UV IR cut as well, so that's into the optical waveband as well, so you're cutting out the infrared and the ultraviolet, it stops the bleeding. Here is my new ASI 224 camera, colour camera. And then underneath that, I've screwed on a two times Barlow lens, and that fits on the 685 infrared filter as well. And then I swap that in and out when I want to go to optical or into the infrared as well. I just swap the filters over, and then that's just a, a, a two times Barlow. And by unscrewing it and not having the long distance, it's brought it down to about, I think, about 1.5 times magnification. So it's not quite strong, uh, not quite as strong, but still brings the F ratio of the telescope up to what I need to look at the moon and the planets. That's the adapter that puts the DSLR and then I can put that 
into a two inch eyepiece holder uh, if I'm looking at photographing the moon or something like that I don't do any deep sky imaging so that really only gets used for that there's the head torch you saw earlier oh don't know what they're from but anyway a couple of uh, dust caps for the eyepieces that screws onto the bottom and has a, a smaller head torch in seems to have got stuck dim red head torch very dim you can hardly see that light coming on either the batteries are flat uh, but anyway I find that a much more useful light uh, when I'm deep sky observing than this one that's far too bright but with this on it's a very dim red light and that's the adapter that screws into the bottom of the 31 mil that's got the one and a quarter inch adapter in and then I can put that in and make it into a two inch adapter various cables that plugs into the planetary camera and that connects the camera to the computer that just lives in there and I have some spare batteries for when I've got the red dot finder on the telescope so that all lives in there that all stuffs back in and I can put the digital SLR goes in there as well uh, or I can put a pair of binoculars in the books go on top and I've got everything I need to go out observing and I'll just stuff that and we're ready to go so that's a pretty strong case it's obviously waterproof uh, when I'm observing as well one of the real lessons I've learned as well is that when you go and get an eyepiece get whatever you're doing get whatever bit of kit you need is always shut it because this will get soaking wet with you but if you've got the lid on at least it stops the interior getting too hot if these things start fogging over inside I break out one of those chemical hand warmers I showed you earlier chuck that in chuck the lid and that's enough to keep everything warm and keep the dew off okay that's the eyepiece case then let's go outside right so now we've got all our clothing on so we're comfortable we've got the toolbox with all the optics and accessories in it's now start to, time to set up the mount here's the mount this is a German Equatorial it's my Optron ZEQ25T and the first thing I do is I plunk it outside and I take the dust covers off and although there are better ways to polar align, I simply look through there, up through there, and get Polaris in the field of view. And I adjust these left and right, and adjust that up and down until I've got Polaris in the centre of the field of view. That's good enough for visual observing, that's good enough for all planetary imaging. Of course, if you're doing deep sky imaging and photography, you want to have it pretty, pretty well spot on, much more accurate methods than the one I've just yeah, described. I want to be outside observing. Uh, one of the most important things to do is to make sure your telescope, your mirrors, your optics have reached the ambient air temperature. Now if you're fortunate enough you've got a, an observatory of course your telescope would live in there and it would naturally be at the ambient air temperature uh, when you open the door. Of course if you keep it in the house it's going to warm up to whatever the air temperature is inside the house. When you go outside you get a small plume, a heat haze forming on the mirror as the mirror is warmer than the ambient air temperature. So uh, I keep my stuff in the garage, uh, I've got a shed as well for the bigger Dobsonian and if I'm away from home I've got the 6 inch Maksutov which I use as my travel scope and what I'll do with that is I put it in the boot of the car. So whatever you do make sure your telescope is cool to ambient, uh, set it up, put it outside for an hour or so before you want to use it or even better leave it outside if you can in a shed in an observatory uh, or whatever else you've got so it's already at that ambient air temperature. You get far better views through the eyepiece, through the camera if you haven't got that plume of warm air, those tube currents rising off the water. So as you can see I've put the counterweight on now, I've put the 6 inch mix suit off on the mount uh, so we're all lined up and ready to go. We've got the hand controller here which we can use to find objects and the other important thing as well is a dew shield because it's got such a large optical surface on the front that's all cooling down it's radiating its heat away to deep space so always put something like this on um, and this is a dew shield it's, it sits over the top so and that just uh, limits the view angle of the optics to the coldness of the upper atmosphere and to space as well. Stops it cooling down, keeps dew off the optics. That means as everything else gets wet and uh, the dew forms, you can carry on observing. Of course, if you get moisture forming on the, on the front surface, there's no way you can carry on uh, observing or using your telescope. 
So always make sure you have that on as well. I've got here a flip mirror, so I can have the camera and an eyepiece uh, in the telescope at the same time. And the advantage of that is I can line up a planet with a finder, I can then check it's in the centre of the field of view, flip them around to the way with that switch, and then the uh, planet should be nicely centred on the chip. Going straight from a finder straight onto the camera is a real faff, and before I had to do that you were swapping, you had to, just with the ordinary telescope without this flip mirror, I was having the eyepiece, getting it sent in the eyepiece, swapping out for the camera, refocusing, finding it wasn't quite in the field of view, swapping them back again, and just having this is such a labour saver, particularly in the mornings when I've got uh, Jupiter, Mars, Saturn, being able to switch from one to the other, uh, but just being able to yeah, get them centred on the chip just by using this is such a labour saver than having the eyepiece and having to swap camera and eyepiece back and forth to get everything centred. Good evening to you all. It's a lovely clear evening. I'm outside with the telescope and if I look over there above the street lights there's a crescent moon hanging in the sky above the trees. So I set the six inch Mac up outside. You can just see the dew shield there. The mount is polar aligned and I've got in the back of the telescope I've got the ASI camera and on the laptop there you can just see Mare Chrysum I've got all my cold weather clothing on, I've got my gloves and we're ready for a night or an evening of lunar observing. So let me just show you this uh, reticle, sorry this uh, flip mirror here. If you look down through the poorly focused, you, know, you can just see the panoptic eyepiece in the finder with the camera in the back and as you can see the camera is now displaying that on the screen. And if I look down through the eyepiece Whatever that is, and flick the switch. There we are, somewhere we can just see in there is the lunar surface. I'm looking down through the eyepiece with the camera, and of course, on the laptop, we've got nothing. And I flick it back, and we're back on, back on the camera, and of course, nothing through the eyepiece. So, it's a really good way of centering the objects that you want to look at without having the faff of changing things over. So I wish you a good evening, I hope you enjoyed the video. And I'll put some of the pictures up of uh, the crescent moon. Right, cheers, bye!